Hello and welcome to the Achieve Optimum Health Summit, where we explore how to prevent and reverse chronic illness. I'm Angelina Kardash, your summit host, and today my guest is Dr. Sunil Pai. Dr. Pai, internationally recognized as an expert in integrative medicine, a health activist, and a leader in the wellness industry. Dr. Pai is one of the first formally trained and board certified holistic integrative medicine physician in the United States over 20 years ago. He certified in Ayurvedic medicine, functional medicine, um, psychological regulating medicine, medical and neuroacupuncture, herbal medicine, plant-based nutrition, and yoga. He is also an author of the critically acclaimed book, An Inflammation Nation. It's a definite uh, 10 steps guide to preventing, treating, and reversing all diseases through diet, lifestyle, and the use of natural anti-inflammatories. Dr. Pai is also the founder of the House of uh, San Germany Integrative Medicine and Health and Lifestyle Center locating, located in um, Albuquerque. Let me... <laughs> Albuquerque. Yes, yes. Thank you for helping me pronounce that. So welcome uh, uh, in, to join me in welcoming Dr. Sunil Pai. How are you today, Dr. Pai? Thank I'm you very so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. I'm doing well. Okay, great. So I know that you take great pride and pleasure in educating audience on wellness and healthy lifestyle. And that's why I'm so excited to get your perspective on inflammation in the relationship uh, to autoimmune and chronic diseases. Sure. So, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this field of integrative medicine. And what is the difference between integrative medicine conventional medicine and alternative medicine. Sure. So uh, just real quick how I got into it. Uh, for those people who are interested in getting a deep dive into understanding not only inflammation, but the 10 steps that we've looked at over 20 years, evidence-based wise, looking at all the epigenetic changes, diet, lifestyle, environment, belief system, uh, including all the research that I have put in the book, about 1,500 references to the scientific uh, articles and, and studies and, and investigative journalism. It was more of a personal aspect of my life where I actually had uh, um, an inflammatory problem as myself. I actually had two types of uh, issues. One was a, I have the, I'm the peanut allergy kid, so I have a severe inflammatory, you know, anaphylactic reaction to food of, of nuts, uh, but also I had a chronic eczema as well. And the eczema was something that plagued me for decades. Uh, and it wasn't until later on, which I'll explain in my book and those people who know me as I went to a plant-based diet, and you know, just as you, you had with your history, um, a lot of things got better. In fact, you know, my eczema just completely disappeared. And the book will explain why, but you know, what we like to look at is like, what are the triggers of that? And especially from a dietary standpoint, it's not just looking at what foods in terms of eating plant-based, but then our practice gets even further looking at this patient's specific immune system and looking at what specific triggers of all foods, plant, vegetables, grains, legumes as well. Uh, could be um, causing an inflammatory response. And then we individualize the person's uh, treatment or recommendations of maybe you should eat less of this. And some of the foods will be able to rotate back in. Some of the foods we're going to say, you know, it's not worth eating or don't eat as much of it because it can cause a flare. Now, the difference between integrative medicine and conventional and alternative medicine is the following, you know, conventional medicine is allopathic, Western medicine, as we all know. And so most people, you know, just know we go to the doctor, we have a hospital, um, and conventional medicine is really good at acute care. And, and I talk about this in my book, I talk about this a lot in my lectures, is because if you have, you know, an accident, a car accident, a you know, gunshot wound, a heart attack, you know, a dog bite, you want to go to the emergency room because the United States is still in the top, you know, uh, three countries or so in terms of outcomes of that. But when it comes to the chronic disease care right now in the United States, we're ranking 46 out of 48 industrial nations in terms of outcomes of all disease. So we're really at the bottom of the barrel and we spent about $4.3 trillion in healthcare. So there's a disconnect, right? So we're really good at acute care and chronic care, we're not. And what happens with Western medicine is that we've lost our way of understanding the concept of that the body has an innate ability to heal. And so we treat with symptoms. So we have wonderful drugs, right, that, that are out there. And almost a day, every day, there's a new drug on the market. Those drugs treat symptoms, but they never have to get to the underlying dysfunction imbalance or disease function and resolve that function. So integrative medicine is quite different because integrative medicine allows us to use a variety of therapies that are evidence-based. So we look at using traditional medicines like Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine, using naturopathy and homeopathy, you know, acupuncture, massage, you know, yoga, a, a variety of other mind-body therapies as 
well and different cultural aspects. And so, but everything that we use is evidence-based. What that means is that there's scientific data in the literature that supports its use, even in cell culture or in animal studies. So we would say in vitro and in vivo studies have been conducted even on the herbs or even on the dietary supplements that we recommend. On the other side, though, when people use alternative medicine, alternative medicine, you know, used to be the opposite of conventional medicine, but now, you know, alternative medicine has kind of taken it a little bit far where a lot of those practices are still not evidence-based. Even if they've been done for a dozen years, no one has ever studied it. Or, in fact, when we've seen outcomes, uh, the outcomes may not be as positive as the internet or marketing might, might um proclaim it to be. So what we would like to do is what integrative medicine is not saying this is better than that or that's better than this. We look at each patient individually and we say, can we use the best of all worlds? And can we look at reducing side effects and looking at, you know, restoring function and rejuvenating function, you know, bringing it back to normal uh, without the, you know, suppression of symptoms or the chronicity of symptoms. So acute care, you know, we love Western medicine. We love diagnostics. We love using tests, you know, and imaging and, and things where we, other medicines may not have that ability to do. But in terms of how do we resolve that condition, it's actually looking at, you know, the, the underlying dysfunctions on, you know, from a, from a, a psychosocial, spiritual, physical, anatomical, immunological basis, and then restoring those functions so that eventually all these diseases can be reversed um, uh, through diet and lifestyle. Can you explain to my viewers in simple terms what inflammation is and how that relates to acute and chronic disease? Yes, so inflammation just in short is, just think of it as the fire within the body. Okay, in my book, we'll talk about some of the, you know, the scientific terms, but just think of fire within the body. And we do need a certain amount of temperature or heat to uh, stimulate certain cell recognition and, and cell signaling. So, for example, um, in an acute aspect, say having a fever, uh, have a cold or a flu, the, the fever actually is a good response of inflammation. The body is raising its blood temperature because viruses, bacteria, and even cancer cells on a certain level do not like high temperature. And so the body does is it evokes this attack of raising the body's blood temperature. So there's a little bit of a field advantage to the immune system attacking the virus, okay? If you sprain your ankle, for example, same thing. If you sprain your ankle, there's a swelling. That acute swelling around your ankle is an inflammatory response. There's some damage. There's some trauma. So the body creates this, like a, it's like a cast. It's a normal cast saying, don't move it. I need to heal it. Okay, so the acute trauma and the acute inflammation usually is a good thing because the body has an immediate aspect that's trying to fix something. The chronic aspect of inflammation, though, is, is, is a problem that most people around the world are having. And inflammation just means, in a root word, just means phlegm, fire, or itis, I-T-I-S. And anything that you have a word and the word itis behind it just means inflammation of that word. So, you know, we think of dermatitis and conjunctivitis, you know, itchy red eyes and runny nose is, is rhinitis and sinusitis and gingivitis and thyroiditis and bronchitis and, and esophagitis and gastritis and colitis, prostatitis, vaginitis, dermatitis, tendonitis. Um, arthritis. So most people have, there's actually 200 different types of itises now in Western medicine. And so the chronic issue is then not just treating it with eye drops and a nasal spray and, you know, oral care and an upper pill and an inhaler and a lower pill or a topical, which most people do in conventional medicine. I can give you a steroid. I can give you immunosuppressive. I can give you an antihistamine. I can give you an acid blocker. I can give you a pain pill. These are all affecting inflammation on direct or indirect pathways. However, they never get at the underlying cause of why we have inflammation. So my goal and, you know, what my book goes into to detail is looking at, you know, over the last 20 years with not only seeing thousands of patients, but what, else, what is also in the literature and the science showing that, you know, inflammation is, is the trigger mechanism that makes every disease worse. So again, if you have Alzheimer's to a cancer, to just diabetes, to obesity, to depression, there's always an inflammatory component and inflammation, the fire just makes anything worse. Just like if you are in your kitchen, you know, the more fire that you have on your stove, you know, you need a sum to cook, but if it's out of control, there's a problem. You can burn your, burn your house down. So the, the aspect is that not only the chronic issue of inflammation, but inflammation then can lead to chronic disease. So then the degeneration of a joint over time, you know, like arthritis, collides. These are things where there's more and more damage. So as time goes on, that patient's symptom gets worse and worse. And even worse than that is that the long-term uh, inflammatory response also can increase higher risk of even cancer coming down the line. So someone, for example, that has a colitis uh, for over 30 years has a 43% increase of getting colon cancer. Or someone has, you know, active rheumatoid arthritis over 10 years has a 71 time uh, increase uh, in risk of getting lymphoma. 
So remember, the body has to repair itself, but it continues to burn in all these areas, then more damage occurs. And then also some bad things can occur even further down the line. So what I'm hearing that we really need to listen to our body. So, I mean, and we live with those chronic symptoms for many, many years and don't pay attention to them. But at the end, basically, they are root cause of all the serious disease. Because absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and, the, and the, the benefit and also the detriment that we have with conventional right. medicine, even over the counter side, someone say, for, let's take heartburn, for example, right? So someone has a little reflux or acid reflux or heartburn. And it's like, oh, they go over the counter or they go to the doctor and they get a pill to suppress that symptom. And, you know, if they're having an acute problem, that might be helpful to get them through the day or that evening or for a while. But what we should be asking is, why do I have heartburn? You know, why is your symptoms, why is your body having symptoms? Now, the, the marketing from pharmaceutical companies would be like, well, control it, right? You know, they show like pictures on the, you know, the Super Bowl was recently, so they'll show foods kind of fighting people, control your food, but really food should be nourishing, all these things should be nourishing, and you shouldn't have to suppress these things. So we have to look at, you know, if you have a sock, if you have a, a rock in your shoe, the answer is to take the rock out, not put more socks on. But we love to put socks on in America. And so the drugs are, you know, become treating symptoms and never getting at looking at the underlying causes. Now, again, in that acute care aspect, someone has migraine headaches or someone having acute flare, those medications can be helpful. But what they're not looking at is that it never prevents them from getting the next one. And it never actually heals the inflammatory response. It just makes your body say, I don't feel the symptoms as much. But that dysfunction is still going on using all these medications in general. Sure, sure. Um, what typical chronic conditions do you treat and diseases in your practice? So in our practice, we, we treat everything. You know, I, you know, I'm traditionally, before I went into integrative medicine and did my fellowship and all my other trainings afterwards, I was, in, I was a family medicine doc here at University of New Mexico. So, you know, we see heart disease, diabetes, and, you know, obesity, blood pressure, you know, depression, anxiety, you know, irritable bowel, colitis. Those are the common things. But, you know, over the last, you know, I would say eight years or now, nine years, is our, about 60% of our patients now are cancer patients. And it's not that we want to see cancer patients as a specialty because that's not, I'm not an oncologist. It's just that the, the population now in terms of the, the, the risk of getting cancer in America, you know, one in two men and one in three women in their lifetime will get cancer. It's now becoming almost on an epidemic proportion where, you know, they, they come in, oh yeah, they already have hypertension. They already have diabetes and, you know, and, and, and lipid problems, but they also have cancer. So now this is like the other aspect that's being added almost to most of the people's lists. And then of the 60% of people that we see that have cancer, unfortunately about 30% of those people are recurrent patients where they've had it now times two. And then out of that, about 10% are about people who have it times three or times four. And a lady had times five the other day, meaning they had the fifth recurrence. And so, you know, again, Western medicine is really good at, you know, removing things, treating it, but it's not about healing it, right? And we need to have both. Like we're not anti-pharma, we're not anti-surgery, we're not anti-chemo radiation, but the idea is that if we just focus on treating the symptom, we don't change the patient's terrain, they're more apt to get the disease again. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, so is there any way to test what are triggers of inflammation from the diet? Yes. So where we specialize is not just moving people towards a plant-based diet because that's where all the data is, right? And probably most people that you'll be interviewing on the summit will be saying you should be eating a whole food plant-based diet. And you recommend that as well through your own his your health story, which is great. We go one step further than that because what we found out, you know, the data will support that 80% of, of, of people's chronic conditions will improve going to a whole food plant-based diet. Now, why isn't it a hundred percent? It's because you have your own specific unique immune system. And so we want to look at is there, is there any kind of food sensitivities um, that could be triggering an inflammatory response? And so we do specialized testing that we looked at what we call immediate and delayed reactions. Some reactions can happen within an hour. And we're not usually talking about anaphylactic reactions like I have my peanut allergy. That's rare. But we're looking at people can still have a reaction that's not life-threatening, but within an hour. So you can eat something, have heartburn, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, your headache, your pain, your rash, you know, your achiness, brain fog. Something can happen within an hour of eating a food. And also something that's called a delay. It can happen a few hours up to four days later. So, you know, you could, you know, today, you know, some Super Bowl was yesterday, so you could add something, you know, on Thursday and then on, on Sunday, you're saying, hey, I'm just watching the game and, and all the symptoms, whatever you have can still be exacerbated. The benefit of integrative medicine, though, is that and how we approach it is that, you know, conventional medicine only looks at anaphylactic reactions. They're only going to test immediate things that could kill you, you know, like my peanut allergy. So they'll only test like five or six things, you know, peanut, shellfish, eggs, dairy, you know, those kind of things like that. 
And then, you know, I'll, I'll say alternative practitioners or other types of practitioners that would be like chiropractors and naturopaths, since they don't have the MD license, they can only test what they call the delayed reactions, right? The benefit of having the integrative practice is that we test for both and we test a full panel because it's not just something that's going to come back and really be life-threatening, but something that's causing the, st the slow chronic inflammatory burn. And so if you move plant-based, what happens is that we're eating a lot of foods that you might still have a sensitivity to. Now we're just eating more of that. So a lot of people come in and they go, you know, I tried to go plant-based or I'm, you know, I'm eating more salads or smoothies or greens or beans or, or you know, lentils or, or onions or mushrooms. And if they come back positive on this, on the test, or usually what happens is they didn't know they had a sensitivity. They try to eat a lot of plant-based foods and then they have an exacerbation of their symptoms. So their colitis might get worse, their rash might get worse, their rheumatoid might get worse. And they go, I, I didn't get that when I was eating the old standard American diet. Um, and so they, they kind of drop off. What we want to do is we want to individualize, like, what is the best maximum anti-inflammatory diet that is in the plant-based world? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what you just explained, so there are different methods and tools and testings, right? How to test for food sensitivity. And as far as I know, there is a like real food sensitivity test and it's quite challenging when you need to go through the elimination diet, right? And kind of focus Right. You know, traditionally, most people did the, you know, before we had all this testing, you know, there was, there was elimination diets and the elimination diet was pretty helpful at looking at more of the acute reaction where if you ate something, you noticed something within, you know, I had like diarrhea or gut, gut issues or a headache or back pain or whatever with, you know, shortly within that time. But, you know, anything that was delayed, that was a few hours up to four days later, it's almost impossible, you know, even if you do the best diet diary to find it, because when we eat foods, particularly if you're not completely whole food plant-based, but most people still, if they're eating plant-based, you know, they're still eating something in a package or they're going to a restaurant. Most ingredients, you know, uh, you know uh, on a piece of even sprouted bread or even a tortilla or something may have a dozen different ingredients, right? And so, so it's hard to know if you did a rotational diet, you know, what is actually coming in uh, and triggering that. So that's where the testing is nice because we can go directly immediately find what you need to eliminate or what you can reintroduce re back into the diet and then get you back into the groove. Otherwise people have this issue. Well, I don't know, or I think a lot of times people also, here's the misnomer. A lot of people will hear about things in books or in other people's stories saying, well, I think it's gluten. So I won't eat gluten. Or I think it's nightshades and I won't eat any of the nightshade foods. We like to look at specifically what's for you because if you just eliminate foods based on what other people tell you, you might be missing wonderful phytonutrients, antioxidants, protein, and fiber that are so healthy for you and you're just eliminating it for no other reason that you've heard of it and you don't really have any kind of data or basis to say, I should not eat that. So what's your approach uh, to diagnostic in your practice? How do you start working with a patient? So we usually, you know, I do, um, you know, we do in-house evaluations. So pe most people come and visit us. Those people who can't come to Albuquerque, then we do like this via tele telemedicine. I do health coaching and then we're able to send them the labs and, you know, we're able to help with them with the guidance of looking at, you know, what other tests that we can look at. Because, you know, most people will have conventional labs. Now, since I'm primary care driven, I still look at making sure that, you know, all the thyroid panels done and all the vitamin Ds and, you know, your lipids and your blood sugar and all the kidney liver function that's all that all should be already checked and done but believe it or not most people can go to the best specialty hospitals and not have that done because everybody's always just looking at your disease and they forget the rest of the person so, so a lot of people we see that have cancer i mean they can just have thyroid problems and no one's ever looked at that or you know because everybody's looking at cancer or you have heart attack and everybody's looking at your cholesterol no one's looking at your blood sugar so you know we like to look at the, the variety of just the primary care labs but then we go further we like to look at not only foods but we also like to look at um microbiome. We like to look at, you know, what is affecting the, the digestive function. So we can look at, you know, your fats, your proteins, your carbohydrates, your fiber intake. Are you absorbing that? Do you have good digestive enzymes, pancreatic function? Is there inflammation in the bowel? Is there any kind of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth called SIBO or small intestinal fungal overgrowth like yeast or candidas or parasites or any of those things are leaky gut, as people would call it. When we measure those things, then there's certain things in the diet that we can recommend that's targeted that can restore that function. Because you can still eat a whole food plant-based diet and still have leaky gut. You can still have, you know, oh, I've had you know, chemotherapy for six months, or I've taken tons of antibiotics for sinus infections or yeast infections or urinary tract infections. We still have to restore that function. And eating healthy can get you there, but it can only get you so far because 
We just need certain targeted therapies to get you over that hump. Once you're over that hump though, then the diet itself, the food becomes even more medicine, right? And so the goal is like, we want to, rest- the, the gut is, is one of the most important areas that we focus in on because the gut is the first point of entry of anything, whether it's a medication or herb or food. And we want all the foods and all the herbs and all the medicines to be as medicinal without the side effects as possible. The other thing is we also look at nutritional testing. So once we get the gut fixed, or if people say, hey, if they don't have any gut problems, then we like to look at, you know, a lot of people take dietary supplements. And, you know, that's an area that we focus in on from a nutrition standpoint, because supplements supplement the diet, they don't replace the diet. So they have to be on a whole food plant-based diet. We have to look at what the foods trigger that, eliminate that. But later on, you know, most people still go to the store and they come with bags of, you know, you might see it like every day on the internet and social media, there's some new superfood, super shake, super protein, super berry, you know, something there, right? Multivitamin, antioxidant, phytonutrient. And so what we like to look at is when we measure like all your B vitamins and your antioxidants, A, C, E, and CoQ10 and glutathione and all the minerals and your omega threes and six and nines and how your neurotransmitters go and how your detoxification pathways go and how, how do you actually convert an omega three and an omega six, even heavy metals, like all these things are looked at. Then we look at if there's a deficiency, the nice thing about the testing is it'll tell us what foods those nutrients are heavily found in. So we're going to say eat more of these foods because you want to get all the other protein, the fiber, and the phytonutrients, not just the antioxidant. But if there's truly a deficiency and it is quite low or it's hard to gain some of those nutrients from foods because it's such a small amount, then supplementation can be very, very helpful and beneficial. So it's very, very targeted. When we recommend something, most people say, I'll take it. And they go, oh my God, I feel better. But right now, most people have take, you know, eight to 12 pharmaceuticals that we see on an average person coming into my office. And they're taking about, you know, a half a dozen or more supplements and they still have their health condition. They're still not feeling better. They're you know, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. Yeah. So our goal is to really like fine tune. It's not just blaming drugs, but we also have to look at, you know, if you're taking something, you know, the potency, purity, safety, efficacy of those nutrients, is there studies to show even what form of that nutrient is better. That's our expertise. And that's what I can provide to the, to the clients. And then we also do like uh, health coaching in terms of nutrition counseling. We do other aspects of mind body practices. We even can use technologies to, to help people with their mind or their body. So there's other aspects that we can teach. We also do cooking classes here. We go shopping with our patients. And so we do, you know, we have massage, we do panchakarma, which is detoxification therapies from India. We have a float tank. We have a yoga room. I mean, we're a full lifestyle center. But even if people are from afar, we can still provide them a lot of education or these are the things or type of services that they can find in their community sure. that you can try and they'll be a great fit because we know that the data will support their use of that. Okay, sure. Um, tell us about the, what role does the microbiome play in inflammatory conditions? So again, like I mentioned before, you know, the microbiome is everything because it's the first point of entry, right? So if you're eating plant-based or most people's standard American diet or paleo keto, you know, everybody's putting something that's pro-inflammatory in their gut that causes the dysfunction. Remember 80% of your immune system is in your GI tract. You have, you know, over a hundred trillion of over a thousand species of probiotics that weigh about four pounds. Okay, so it's, like, so it's like you're feeding yourself either good foods that either will prevent and reverse disease or you're feeding yourself stuff that will actually cause disease. And so I tell people, think of your body like a $300,000 you know, Ferrari or Lamborghini. You'd only put good fuel in the car. You would never stop at a cheap gas station and put some cheap gas. You'd have to look at NASCAR fuel. It has to be certain octane to know that the engine will run right. We, for some reason, don't treat ourselves as good as our cars, and so we like to put cheap fuel because we were told more is better. I can go to a big box store and get 10 for a dollar or you know, whatever, and this is the problem where we're putting bad fuel that causes disease. Now, interesting thing is when we talk about the microbiome is that most people in America have the microbiome dysfunctional because we've all taken antibiotics on some level, right? Infections and surgeries, sometimes chemotherapies. Sometimes we just get sick. We ate something at the, at the football game or we went on a cruise or we went traveling, you know, and hiking and I ate something in the river and, or drank something in the river. We get a diarrheal illness, for example. So there's a lot of things that can, and even stress, all these things can make the gut go off. So our goal is really looking at how do we restore that function? If you restore that function, then the, 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 the maximum nutrient absorption assimilation and excretion is perfect. If the gut's not fixed, it doesn't matter the latest and greatest drug, latest, greatest herb or supplement, the patient won't do better unless that is restored. Okay. What's your opinion on uh, probiotics? 
I like probiotics, but there's a problem with probiotics from a manufacturing standpoint and from a limitation standpoint. So when we look at in my, in my book, I have a section on how to look at these type of things and what to look for when you look at a probiotic label, what to look for in terms of how they manufacture. Right now, 90% of probiotics on the market have about 10% of whatever the potencies on the bottle. Say if it says 10 billion of, you know, say eight or 10 species per serving, you know, one to 10 billion, for example. Um, we provide 100 billion, for example, in a serving, but it has about 10% of what's on the bottle in the bottle by the time you take the bottle. So there's a huge, you know, it's a, it, it's very minimal in terms of the the clinical effectiveness. Um, a lot of them, you know, they don't list the specific species. They just say a proprietary blend, and sometimes they're only just giving you the top of that blend and very little of the rest. If it's not acid stable, then it goes through the stomach and it just gets destroyed in the stomach acid. And a lot of them, you know, they they get they degrade very easily, um, you know at room temperature. And so ours that uh, we look at when manufacturing, and we're kind of a little neurotic on that, you know, ours are stable up to one year after expiration date, even at room temperature. So we look at degradation times. We look at, you know, studies where, you know, if we kept that out on the shelf and when, you know, in this room temperature, a year after it expired, it will still have exactly what it is on the bottle because we start off with higher levels. It is acid stable. Now, that being said, although we give this nice potency of probiotic in our clinic here, and it's really helpful when people have, you know, diarrhea illnesses, colitis illnesses, you know, infl inflammatory responses or recent antibiotic or chemotherapy or surgery, for example. However, that's only just a small portion of how we restore microbiome because fiber, which only comes from plant foods, is the true master of what we want to feed the microbiome. You know, we need to get to about 40 grams a day slowly over time uh, of plant-based foods. Only plants have fiber. So anything that's an animal protein, which has a mother or face, is an animal protein foods, I tell people, my patients. Anything has a mother or face, eat less mothers and faces. That's easy to remember, okay? Um, and then because those things don't have any fiber. Okay, and so fiber is what feeds your probiotics. Fiber what gives them the energy molecule, the n butyrate, which is like a, I call it the CoQ10 of your gut. Uh, fiber is what gives them also prebiotics. You know, we get it from the plant foods. So there's a lot of variety of things. And the more fiber that you do over time, you're able to expand and grow the healthy probiotics and the microbiome. We like to give like 12 of what we call the Avengers of your gut. You know, here's the 12 superheroes that everybody knows, but there's a whole Marvel comic universe of characters in your gut that are still healthy and important. Also, fermented foods can be uh, helpful as well. Uh, so I don't mind people having some kombucha or kimchi or the, all the different kind of crowdy, briny products that actually ferment uh, the probiotics coming naturally from the foods. That is adding more and more. Most cultures actually do that on some level. Um, we don't do that now as much in the United States. Now it's really popular because we have kombucha and krauts and all these things. But the more that you can get from the food as well, that's helpful. So I always look at adding probiotics in specific cases that people need it and then changing their diet, making sure that they're getting the fiber. And then also over time, including and introducing to some of these fiber and um, uh, fermented foods. And what's your opinion on microbiome testing? So there's a variety of microbiome testing. Some of them are very limited. Um, ours is pretty extensive because we've been looking at, you know, a company has been doing microbiome testing for now since, I don't know, maybe 20 years or more. So it was before even this word microbiome. And so back then, you know, believe it or not, people thought, oh, this is, you know, this is not real or those tests. And now everybody, you know, even the GI doctors is, you know, the, you go to the normal, you know, CME conference at a university, microbiome, microbiome, because now we're understanding, you know, we didn't understand it as much. The testing every year gets better and better, but we're still at the tip of the iceberg. You know, we like to look at all the functions. So there is some like over the counter kits that people can get online on social media and they're very limited because they're looking at like, what foods they kind of should recommend. You know, people want to know like, well, what diet should I eat? The interesting thing is that if you really look at the data, you should be eating the same whole food plant-based diet is that if the gut's off, you have to look at why can't you eat the most healthiest foods? So we like to restore that function. A lot of people say, well, I can't eat beans or I can't eat legumes or I can't eat, you know, these other aspects. Um, I get symptoms for that. So we have to look at, well, then why are you having symptoms from eating the most healthiest foods that all the research will show and the people who live the longest eat most of, right? It's not just avoidance of those foods. So sometimes some of those tests can be misleading because patients, again, a symptomatic feel like, oh, it tells me don't eat this because I have trouble, so I won't eat that. We have to look at, well, why, is, what is wrong? 
And then what can we do to help restore that function? When we do that, then you know, the, the diet can expand even more. People end up opening up a variety of fruits and vegetables and grains and legumes and spices that they didn't know before because usually it's a restriction that people kind of go through. And then they go, oh, I'm very limited on what I can eat because I can only tolerate you know, white bread or you know, only chicken. Or, you know, and some people's diets become very bland and very limited. And we like to start to expand and grow that as well. So uh, for those who suffer from chronic or autoimmune illness, so the first thing that I'm hearing from you, just switch right away to a plant-based, whole food plant-based diet. Right. But in addition to switching to a plant-based diet, how else can people reduce their inflammation naturally? So two ways. Number one, first, let's go back to the microbiome and foods. Because you know, when people say autoimmune, I write this in my book, I say this in my lectures all the time, autoimmune means a little bit of a misnomer in conventional medicine because autoimmune means the body is attacking itself, which is correct, right? So people develop antibodies, right? So we think of rheumatoid and your joints and lupus and your kidney and your MS and your central nervous system and colitis and your gut and thyroiditis and the thyroid and you know, other kind of autoimmune diseases. However, the body has not been created or designed or whatever people want to believe, but it's never been designed to have an attack on itself. There's always a trigger. Okay. So I give a simple analogy to this, that every week, if you follow the, the, the news media, say in uh, elementary school and in mid, middle school, there's, a, there's now a suicide happening almost on a weekly basis. Right. And when I was in middle school, you know, I was like riding skateboards and we're chasing girls and going to the mall, you know, like most kids would be doing. And now, you know, kids are taking these drastic measures where they take their own life. But when they investigate and look deeper, the child had a, a bully. And the bully is what actually pushes that person to do something completely opposite of what they should be doing. Same thing with your cell. The cell's like, okay, here's my knee joints or here's my kidney cells or here's my, my central nervous system cells. It does not want to attack itself for no other reason except when there's a trigger. So the problem is in Western medicine is that when someone has an autoimmune disease, which is usually inflammatory based, okay, and it could be a variety of different aspects, that when we have a magic drug like steroids, Okay, or biologics or immunosuppressive agents, we can give something where the symptoms will just drop like this, right? So they feel good. They feel great. And, you know, when they're flaring, thank God we have those things. However, it's not getting at the underlying cause of why they have the fire, what is causing the inflammation, right? So they feel good, but we don't have the trigger, right? And so the, so the, the misnomer is that the body never, if, if you don't get at the underlying triggers, then even if they take these wonderful autoimmune medications that suppress it, the disease does not get better. It just treats symptoms. So underlying, they're still having the fuel leak. You just keep putting water on the fire, but the fuel leak is still going on. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. So we like to look at you know, going further. And so not only just finding the foods and fixing the microbiome, but there's a couple of things that we give that will actually help stimulate the immune system to be stronger. And in our case, and what I've studied for many years now, over a decade, is what are the natural agents that, are, that have been studied clinically that can be given to help reduce inflammation? And that's taking natural anti-inflammatories. And we have a product that we've worked on for many years. It's been patented. Uh, we have clinical studies. Uh, and in fact, the, the ingredients on there have the most clinical studies each of each of those ingredients more than any other product on the market. And it's called Bosmeric SR. It's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-inflammatory that's safe, natural, and effective has a 20 minute onset of action and an eight hour sustained release using four ingredients, three of them which are patented right now. And so what we wanna do is we wanna avoid people taking the um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, right? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are like the ibuprofens and the naproxens and the acelococcibs, which are, you know, the names are, would be uh, in the brand names you'd hear like Advil and Motrin and, and Celebrex or, or Aleve. Those things all have what they call black box warnings. And so black box warnings, if you read my book, that's another section that I go into uh, what a black box warning is. Black box warning means that if you, eat, if you take the drug, it can lead you into the black box, which is basically the um, casket of, of, of things. Now, not all drugs have black box warnings, but for the anti-inflammatories that you get over the counter or by prescription, they all have a black box warning. And that means right now, according to the black box and, and according to FDA, you can get a heart attack or a stroke or a GI bleed from just taking one of them. So even though people take it all the time, like, oh, I take ibuprofen, I have a headache or I have menstrual cramps or I got back pain, I'm traveling on the, you know, whatever, you take it. But once you take that, you are having a risk that you can actually have that problem. Now, more people now have that problem, and that's what is called the black box warning. So it's not rare, it's actually common. But if it's so dangerous, why don't they pull it off the market, people will ask. It's because once they have the black box warning, once you open up that pill or package, that means you've accepted those terms and conditions herein. 
right? So you can't sue them. So that's why, you know, one third of Americans take up uh, an uh, NSAID every day and there's 30 different generic brands in the market because there's no liability risk, right? And one of the number one causes of death right now in the United States that has surpassed heart disease and cancer and stroke is Western side effects and medical errors. And of those, the NSAIDs is one of the largest classes of that medical side effects. That we just, we just take it for granted. We can go to a big box to get 2,000 caplet bottle of ibuprofen for very inexpensive, not understanding that that's contributing to heart attacks and strokes and GI bleeds. And we think it's just the cholesterol or just you know, the bad lifestyle. If people have any of these other aspects, their risk is even higher. So if they already had heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and blood pressure, and then they take these ibuprofens or those kind of things, it's even a higher risk. So we have natural things that have studies and that we, you know, people can have a fast-acting, long-lasting effect and transition. But even when we give these, we, we, you know, we, most of our patients say, that's a magical pill. You know, Bosmeric has done so much to change my life. We still have to look at what's your underlying triggering cause, right? We're just looking at something that won't kill you, won't put you in the black box, something that doesn't have side effects. You know, one thing that people don't realize is that when they take a nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory, after two years in the, in the orthopedic uh, studies, will show that there's degeneration of the joint. So if you take an ibuprofen daily for two years or an Aleve or a naproxen or a Celebrex, you'll see that a radiological, meaning they can, the x-rays they can take, and after two years, we start to see degeneration of your knees and your joints. But most people take it for arthritis of their knees and their joints, right? So some of these drugs that, that we give to treat symptoms are actually exacerbating their symptoms and it becomes a vicious cycle. We want to stop and arrest that. The nice thing is that when we use things like bosmeric, we're looking at blocking over 100 different mechanisms of inflammation naturally and upregulating, downregulating regulating gene expression, enzymes, protein reactions. So it's not just you know, a one bullet thing. It's a balanced formula that people can take it for long periods of time without having side effects and without actually building tolerance. Mm -hmm. It's Everything absolutely makes sense to me. And based on my experience, I mean, switching to plant-based diet, so you get rid of a lot of symptoms and especially pain. Right. So, right. I mean, the right. headaches, you know, got everything. But still, in the rare cases when there is a, like, immediate pain, maybe it's a tooth pain, something right. that caused, you know, by some inflammation reaction of your body that you don't expect. So what would be the right pill that you can take or the right supplement to remove the pain, the source of pain. Yeah, so the Bosmeric SR, -S 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 rcom that's where you can get it at or look at the information. But that's our go-to because, you know, we want to replace the non steroidal anti-inflammatory in everybody's home. So people can take this as just if they have a headache or back pain or tooth pain. You know, and, you know, even if you go plant-based, you can still have pain. You can still you know, get injured. You know, most of us, like, now that we feel better, we exercise more right? Now that we feel better, we lose weight, we, we're more active, right? But we can still fall, we can still have injury, you know, we can always overdo it in the gym. And, and, you know, and most people, you know, where I find a little bit of fault is that a lot of people who are plant based now will say, okay, we're lifestyle doctors, they call them, right? So they say lifestyle medicine, here's plant based, which is all great, they should be doing that, right? And then they go, oh, we have pain, here's ibuprofen, right? There's a disconnect, because the, if we're saying food is medicine, then your medicine should also be from the same similar foods, plant-based. 70% of pharmaceutical drugs have been derived from plants, but sometimes we forget that. So we will say the diet's great, but then we just want to write a prescription or, or just get this over the counter, or just take ibuprofen, that's good. That's not really, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an odd disconnect. Um, and so we like to make sure that we're moving to that, that, that natural base. A lot of people, again, will again, clear the diet, you can still have, you know, a car accident, injuries, accidents, post-surgery, or you've had degeneration for 20, 30 years, and now you're going plant-based, right? So, so you're a healthy person, I'm a healthy person, so we may not need to take bosmeric every day. I'd take one a day in the morning, maybe one in the evening if I need to. Since it helps with inflammation, then people have allergies, for example, or, or skin, re you know, all the itises that we can get, think of them, it will help lower that. So you can take it for prevention or you can take it for intervention or treatment. Uh, but at the minimum, we want people to replace the NSAID in the home so they're not gonna take something and inadvertently have a black box warning side effect. Sure, sure, yeah, okay. Um can you rank environmental toxins in terms of uh, um, endocrine disruptive properties? And what is the most toxic to humans? We have exposure of BPA, uh, chlorinated water, pesticides, chemicals in our skincare. And I mean, what are the ways to protect ourselves? 
you know. So let's start with the water because that's really important. Most people, you know, we consume water, right? You know, our body's made of water and most of the foods are we get in water. So I always look at investing, you know, in at least some kind of reverse osmosis at minimum in the house, right? And they're about 200 bucks uh, and it's way cheaper, you know, if you have it installed and they have these, up, you know, things that can go in apartment complexes. Some people don't have room, but there's all sorts of things that are out there that can be reverse osmosis. Now it does eliminate most of the things that we we're, we're concerned about in the water. And there's certain filters now that, you know, can get even further further about removing chloramines, not just chlorines, and then remove, now we can remove PUFAs and PUFOs and all these other things that are chemicals that are in the environment. And some of them can even take out some of the pharmaceutical drugs that are being recycled in the, in the waste management system, right? So depending on where you live, I recommend people actually testing because you can get these little testing kits that look at heavy metals and pesticides, herbicides, and you can get it at the local, you know, the local, um, um, hardware stores and then you know they can just dip it in the water and they can test and then you can fine tune what do you have whether you live in LA or New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or Las Vegas or in Albuquerque all our water systems are different I look at you know environmental working group ewg.org and look at the water report in your area because that is going to be different than what your city provides we want to look at what is the true data of in terms of what could be a potential carcinogen or toxic and our government levels right now to me are a joke, you know, the EPA here has been dismantled pretty much under this last current administration. And so we have to look at, you know, if it was in Europe and other countries, what are they looking at? And they're very strict. We want to make sure that there's things that are not going to be causing. There's fracking, there's chemical spillage. And now we, this actually this week, they just uh, took away the Clean Water Act for rivers and streams and lakes. And so now there's more dumping that goes into the waterways that go into farming foods and stuff like that. So clean water is good. Now what people forget though, is why we want to go whole foods plant-based is because you can clean your home environment. I even got a whole water filter in my house and I got, you know, I'm really good at that. Um, I even took like when I went to this conference in New York, I just took a, I have a water belt bottle that had a filter. So I could just fill up at the sink or the, or at the, you know, they have little pitchers of water from the hotel and you can smell the chlorine there and I can just drink it and I'll filter that out. So you want to be getting as clean as water as possible. But what a lot of people forget is that when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, there's a lot of water content in whole foods. Right. But what we forget is that when we buy a lot of packaged food, so people are like, oh, I'm bring, drinking orange juice. Well, it's reconstituted oranges with water. So that water is coming from Florida or someone's drinking an iced tea. It could be coming from New Jersey or Los Angeles. So it's not just what's in your home, which you can clean up really well. But when people buy all these other products that have liquid in there or sauces or gravy, you have to look at, well, where is that coming from? And I don't want people to get, you know, too obsessed with that, but people forget like sometimes there is contamination in other cities and other places that are way higher with certain products. And I'm like, I don't get certain things coming from certain cities or states. So cleaning the water is super important for me because that's the largest exposure that people will get on a daily basis. Now, looking at from the food standpoint, I was looking at is trying to go as much organic as possible. You know, we want to avoid glyphosate as much as possible, which is Roundup that's, you know, now been linked and shown in, in most European studies. And in, in my book, I have a cover uh, of looking at, there's about 22 different statistically significant onset of increases of disease since we started using that heavily in our food uh, um, exposures. And these are things where you can avoid that by getting organic as much as you can. Uh, also looking at the environmental working group, the dirty dozen list, I always look at, you know, what is the top 12 things? Because not everybody has access to organic foods. Not everybody can afford organic foods. Now, if you live in a place like I do, we work with our, our co-ops, we work with our community support of agriculture. So there's ways that you can get really healthy food for a very inexpensive price because you just cut out all the middleman, right? A lot of people want to go to these kind of fancy health food stores, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy. It's presented in a nice way. It's got nice lighting and, you know, oh, you can use your points and you can get free movies and blah, 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 right, as a member. But we have to look at, you know, is it truly organic or not? And most of the stores right now, there's a shift in some stores actually adding more organic. And there's some of these, these big health stores are actually moving away from organics, okay? So I like to look at organic foods because you're getting less pesticides, herbicides, you know, glyphosate. These are all endocrine disruptors. These are all hormone disruptors, you know. So the more that you can get it from cleaner foods and cleaner water, I just start with that. Um, and uh, can we talk about the 10 steps mentioned in your book and inflammation, inflammation nation and how we can reduce inflammation with the 10 steps? Yeah, so the 10 steps, and I'll go th I won't go through them all here, but a few of them will be like, again, start off with a whole food plant-based diet, which is an anti-inflammatory diet. You know, when people have a question of like, well, I need to eat animal protein. 
you know, or, or, or plants don't have this or that. Really, the, the only question you have to ask is, is it pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory? And if you can answer that, just drop the mic and leave the room. It's that, it's that simple. Everybody's kind of trying to spin, oh, this amino acid or that one might be missing or that's not actually true. That's all been debunked and, and, and refuted in the science, but they will still spin that. Like there's something deficient or not full in a plant-based diet. What you have to look at is like, where's your anti-inflammatory protein? Where's your phytonutrients? Where's your antioxidants? And where's your fiber? And that's predominantly only found in plant foods. So remember, animal proteins don't have fiber. Animal proteins don't have phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are all the, um, everything that you see in the health store or anything that you start seeing in the study now is driven from a plant. Remember, I mentioned that, right? So when you think of like curcumin and, and you know, boswell, you see ginger, you see black pepper, you see reservatol, green tea, lycopene, lutein, bilberry, xanthines, all these things that you start seeing, you know, um, you know, the indols from the greens and the allisons from the, the garlic and the onions and all these things, flavonoids, they only come from plants. There's no beef, pit, chicken, pork, uh, a dairy pill that is given by a doctor to prevent or reverse or treat a disease. We forget that. Everybody's like, but what happens? This is coming from this fruit. This is coming from this vegetable. This is coming from this, you know, uh, plant. And so we have to look at, we should be eating more of those foods, okay? And remember, plant, uh, animal protein has no fiber, so we need the fiber as well. Little antioxidants now in factory farming, about 97% uh, of food is factory farm, so less antioxidants. So if you eat a plant-based diet, it's number one, okay? Anti-inflammatory, and then try to go organic as much as you can. And I give examples of, again, you know, where to get those resources in the book and also looking at where you can look at how to reduce some of the risk of like the water and those things. Second thing is, you know, after the whole food plant-based diet, we want to test, number two is we want to test what foods are triggering? So immediate and delayed reactions, okay? And again, that's our specialty, what, what we've been focusing on and, and what kind of, even the testing methodologies because there's variances, like some tests can have a lot of false positives. So doctors go, that test is not very accurate. So we wanna eliminate some of that chitter chatter that you hear out there on, on the internet as well. Third thing is we wanna look at is how do we um, detoxify? Okay, and detoxification is important. Now we they have a whole a whole section there on panchakarma, and that's another discussion. But you know, a lot of people think detoxification is some kind of seven-day colon cleanse or some kind of product, and all. We'll, we'll dispel all that myths. It's about it's about actually a true practice. Panchakarma and, and detoxification actually is derived from Ayurveda, you know, in India. So a lot of people think it's like it's a Western term. It's like the how you clean the body from the you know different parts of the tissues from the mind and the body out. Uh, it's and actually people go to the hospital and clinics in India to actually do these kind of therapies, and that's one of our specialties in our clinic. Um, we also look at you know quitting smoking, right? So a lot of people still smoke, and now a lot of people are vaping. So you got to avoid that. We got to tell people how to um, el eliminate. Um, the use of NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. How do we use like things like Boston America's natural anti-inflammatories? How do we stimulate your immune system? So we, we fix the microbiome. I have a big section on the book. So anybody who's taking purple pill or anything for their gut or IBS, the book is going to be right for you because those symptoms, particularly those people who have GI problems like IBS, those are the easiest things to fix because the inflammation is directly right there. Right, so, the, so they're the people who turn around the quickest when you change their diet and find the triggers. Um, then also we look at the things that are shown in the science in terms of what comes from the foods and also what comes in science that we can actually now extract and make into pills um, that will improve your natural killer cells. How do we improve your immune system functioning? Because it's your body getting stronger at fighting, fixing, and repairing versus just, oh, I need to take, a, you know, I'm sick, I need to take it in a box. Well, that is we have to prevent people from getting sick as often. It's not just the treatment, it's the prevention of them getting sick. So increasing the immune system, and we, we, we recommend things like Glucan 300 and things that actually have in vitro and in vivo studies, and we do comparative studies against 60 products on the market. So we look at products that, for example, independent universities will do tests now and say, out of the products that we know that are beneficial, what works best? You know, eating mushrooms are great. You know, mushrooms, oats, and barley, they all have these, you know, these compounds of polysaccharides called beta-glucans. That is super helpful for your immune system. But there's certain people and most people, you know, the stress level is so high now, our immune system is, you can be plant-based and if you have stress, your immune system is down. You can eat plant-based, be organic and, you know, and, you know, all these other things. If you're stressed, your immune system goes down. So how do you keep your immune system stronger? We go that in uh, detail in the book. Uh, we look at how to reduce glucose and sugar diabetes, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, and, you know, people, you know, how much added sugar shouldn't you have, um, understanding, you know, salt, sugar, that aspect in the foods and how we go through the data on how you can eliminate those things, what you can use naturally, avoiding all these artificial sweeteners, pink, yellow, blue packets out, you know, 
Um, but how those things affect your physiology, and there's wonderful studies we'll go into in our book about how, you know, we can eliminate these things from schools and the children get smarter on their, you know, we can eliminate these things in prisons and there's less fighting and more cooperation. So there's a lot of data that people have no idea that if they understood the data, then they could be more activist in being, I want this in my school or I want this in my public community level of how do we make that food the medicine at the end of the day. And then we look at things like meditation and yoga, and that's really underlooked and underthought of these days. You know, a lot of people think it's an exercise, but it's actually yoga's preparation for meditation. So we talk about your parasympathetic system and sympathetic and fight or flight overdrive. And we look at how we move energy. It's not just strength and, and muscle building and flexibility, which it does, but it's like, how do we bring someone to this calm, relaxed, focused state? Right. And that, then the data will show, we, we showed that in studies, like you can still lower your cholesterol. You can still lower your blood sugar. You can still improve bone density just by doing yoga. Right. There's certain asanas and pranayams and, and postures that we've been trained in India specifically that we can actually give like prescriptive yoga, believe it or not. And there's places in India where they don't even use the, the herbs now. They just they've been just I mean, it's one level higher on mind body medicine. I'm still an herbalist by nature. I like to give things because that's part of our training in Western medicine. But they can just do that just with mind body aspects. So when you, you, you use, use those things in combination. Wonderful, wonderful out outcomes. And lastly, we talk about like community, tribe, love, um, and relationships. You know, we have to have a sense of purpose. We also have to have uh, service. These are things that we look at long-term studies, the longest-term survivors of even cancer. The more people that they have community and they have service, they live longer. Right. So certain things are very simple. They're inexpensive. They're not a pill. They're just like you know, have a meeting, have a social group, to find your tribe. You know, we, we have a term right now which we like to use, like we're able to turn cancer survivors into cancer thrivers. Mm -hmm. You know, as Americans, we can survive almost anything, right? We have gunshots, we have, you know, hurricanes and, you know, all these kind of terrible things that can happen on a daily basis. But can we, that's surviving. But thriving is actually doing better than what you were before. And that's our whole aspect. In my book, go through these 10 steps. And by, you know, the idea is that you go through, start with one and you go through 10. You don't have to be perfect at all of them. And I tell people, go through the 10 and then go back to the first one and, and keep refining each of them. Don't put, you know, don't say it's, I only do one and I'm done or only do 10 and I'm done. But the reason why, because these are all the epigenetic factors that the science has shown and clinically that we've seen over 20 years and thousands of patients, all the epigenetic changes have to be done. If you do those things, then everything gets better. But remember, you don't have to be 100% perfect in everything. Even if you just started getting 10 or 20%, 50%, everything starts to lift up. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pai, for being with us today. You're such an inspirational and passionate speaker. And uh, I absolutely love what you do in this world. And you know, your mission of spreading the truth about how we can live, you know, healthier and happier and longer life is absolutely remarkable. Well, thank you for having me. For those people who want to take a look at my book, it's called www. You can go to the website, An Inflammation Nation. That's aninflammationnation.com. It's also available on Amazon and iTunes on Audible as, a, as an audio book as well. And in, one of the things that's really exciting to me is that this year we're going to be looking at a project of an approach that we might turn it into a documentary film. So even, even more people will be able to get this information out. That's exciting. And I also would like to encourage our viewers to take the time and check your website, www.sanjevani.net. Um, right. Stay healthy always. I'm your host, Angelina Kardash, and thank you for watching us today.